Good afternoon and welcome to the Henry Schein Medical COVID-19 webinar series. On behalf of our entire team, thank you for joining us today and most especially once again, thank you for everything you are doing to help patients during this challenging time. My name is Sanchia Patrick and I'm the Executive Director of Strategic Marketing for Henry Schein Medical and I will be your host for today. If you're joining for the first time, our objective with this series is to provide you with new information, new resources, and new tools to help you navigate this pandemic. Today, we will be hearing about the financial strategies and new federal programs available to physician practices to address the unprecedented challenges you may be facing. Before I introduce our three experts from the American Medical Association, we want to ensure you have a quick overview of the webinar platform. For those of you new to GoToWebinar, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. All attendees are currently in listen-only mode. We will not be using the raise your hand feature. However, you can ask questions throughout the entire webinar. We will have time towards the end of the webinar for a Q&A with our three presenters, and the questions will be summarized and aggregated accordingly. So please ask questions throughout. And feel free to post uh, in the chat and communicate with other providers throughout the country. So today, as you already know, we are talking about physician practice financial sustainability during the COVID pandemic. And we are delighted to be welcomed by three phenomenal presenters of the American Medical Association, George Cox, Director of the Division of Legislative Council, Carol Vargo, the Director of Physician Practice Sustainability, Physician Satisfaction and Practice Sustainability, and Jennifer McLaughlin, the Assistant Director of Federal Programming. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being here today. And Carol, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Sanchia. And thank you to the Henry Schein team for providing the opportunity for the AMA to highlight um, the efforts the resources and the strategies that we are um, working on pretty much around the clock to help you, uh, physician practices and others, whether it be chief financial officers or other uh, participants on the um, physician uh, patient care team to really weather um, what has already been noted is a complete unprecedented moment in history right now with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and I really want to say thank you to all of you who have um, registered, um, are either going to be joining us live today or also listening to this at our later date. Um, we look forward after the presentation to hearing from you about your, your biggest challenges and um, this will inform our strategy going forward. I'm going to cover the agenda for today. Um, first, I'll be kicking it off. And I would like to start with an overview of just the AMA strategic plan. Um, and the reason I will cover that is because it will, will demonstrate sort of the work that we have been doing all along at the AMA has really well prepared us to very quickly pivot to develop the resources and the advocacy action plan that's needed to, to help physicians at this time. Um, then I will do a brief overview of what we understand to be the current environment for physicians during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you well know this, but we are tracking this very carefully as well and seeking information from the front lines every day. And then I'm going to cover a document that my team has put together within the AMA Practice Sustainability and Professional Satisfaction Unit around financial strategies for practices. I will then turn it over to my colleagues in our advocacy unit, George Cox and Jennifer McLaughlin, who are going to cover the federal programs which have been enacted uh, very much due to a lot in large part AMA advocacy. Um, we know that those programs are changing literally almost daily. Um, what we are providing to you today will be an overview of where we understand where those programs are at this very moment. And then we will go into what I think is the most important is the question and answer from you all. As I mentioned before, I'd like to do a little context setting only to demonstrate to you why the AMA is in the, in the position we are today to be producing the resources we have. Um, under our uh, strategic plan led by our CEO, Jim Madera, we have really focused on what we call our three strategic focus arcs. Um, and they really focus on first remo removing the obstacles that interfere with patient care and that whether it be regulatory burdens 
or workflow challenges with EHRs. Um, we have been working on these tirelessly, and this is really the sweet spot for where my colleagues in advocacy and my team um, in uh, practice sustainability focus. We also in the AMA are leading the charge to prevent chronic disease and confront public health crises. And with our expert health and science team, we have really been able to establish very quickly a direct line with the Center for De Disease Control and other entities to really understand what's happening in the fast moving environment of COVID. And finally, we've been driving the future of medicine to tackle big challenges. This is our big initiative around innovation. And you will see a lot of fruits of that coming out with regards to us being on the, the front lines of trying to drive the adoption, for example, of telehealth, which has become incredibly important overnight for so many practices. So I'm sure I don't have to let, I'm sorry. If somebody could mute their line, please. Thank you so much. There's a little bit of background noise. Excellent. Thank you. Um, as I probably do not have to uh, let all of you know on the front lines, there is um, a tremendous amount of stress in our system right now due to COVID. We are collecting and tracking this information. We are doing surveys, um, and a lot of this is gleaned from that. But really at the top line, we understand that the stress on frontline clinicians and hotspots with regards to COVID care um, has been um, tremendous. So there's a lot of needs around trying to address um, burnout, um, even just getting the adequate equipment to them um, has been a, a huge lift for many of us in our system. We also know, as I just referenced, there has been literally a, a sea change in adoption of telehealth, where we understand some large health systems who may have had potentially 25% of their visits being done by telehealth, virtually in three to four weeks now doing that 75% of their visits. We have seen, and I think this has a, a significant impact on sustainability and practice finances, at the same time, while we are very, very busy in our ERs and our hotspots and in many primary care physician offices, because of restrictions on non-essential care, it has limited many practices, hospitals, and health systems activities and sources of revenue. And that's really gonna be the topic of our conversation today. And also we're struggling with the, the consideration for current and I would say future needs ongoing for clinician services, laboratory test kits, and access to PPE. Um, uh, these are some of the highlights of surveys, much many are out there. Um, many hospitals could face layoffs within two months, despite all the federal stimulus package. Uh, some surveys have found that 97% of practices have experienced a negative financial impact directly or indirectly related to COVID. And I understand we have uh, many dental practices uh, potentially on the line today. And we see here that there's been also a tremendous slowing down of anything that's non-emergent in the dental visit. Additionally, looking at what's happening to our primary, uh, primary care clinicians, um, less than half have reported that they have enough patient volume and cash to stay open for the next four weeks. There's been a substantial decrease in in-office visits. 22% uh, of our primary care practice have reported that they don't use video visits. 42% of them have not been able to use e-visits. And 65% of them have patients who cannot use virtual health, whether they do not have access to broadband or a computer. And so while I think many have viewed telehealth as an important tool during this crisis, we have to remember that there are many practices and many communities where this simply is not possible. I also want to point you to the fact that we're also continuing to gather stories and understand what's happening on the front lines. Um, we have a dedicated um, Share Your Story page on our COVID resource page, where we want to hear directly from front frontline clinician, clinicians with their questions and business challenges. And we're encouraging you to share those with us. Currently, as we track these every day, the top topics obviously have been practice financial sustainability, PPP, PPE availability, 
uh, understanding what's happening in the CARES Act, and just simply the longer term overall operational impact. Today, for the, and the, for the next floor slides, I'm going to be personally just covering a new resource that I think has been a tremendously um, uh, downloaded and viewed resources we, we have put together, which is keeping your practice of business during COVID-19. I'm going to go through some of the steps and tips that are in this uh, resource and document. I do want to note that I think it's important for all of you um, in the audience to understand is that the AMA has a very, very thorough COVID resource page, and all of those materials are free of charge and available to anyone, regardless of whether or not they're an AMA member. The AMA feels strongly that the, the um, resources that we have put together um, should be um, understood and taken advantage of by many, many in the healthcare um, system, and um, you do not have to be an AMA member. Let me take a deeper dive into these tips for keeping your practice in business. Um, we felt very strongly that we needed to put together sort of an action plan with these tips just to help physician practices recognizing they're completely inundated with just with the day to day to, day, to put together a plan. So let me start by saying first, the most important thing we felt is that um, any physician practice, regardless of size, should really put in a process for rapid decision making and planning and establish a clear chain of command to ensure decisive action. I think that does a lot in terms of making people on the care team and in the practice as employees feel like there's a plan here and we have confidence that that plan will be executed decisively going forward. We also advise for practices immediately to try to go back and understand your insurance coverage. Review your insurance, insurance do documents so that you can understand your risk. You need to know what, where you stand with your existing liability coverage, and you may in fact also want to reach out to your consulting legal counsel. We also think you need to put together a plan to evaluate your ongoing financial obligations. Clearly, um, at this time, um, revenue is no longer coming in, but you are still on the hook for many important things, whether it be your overhead, your rent, your employee costs, your liability insurance. You really need to take a tough look at those plans, review them, and see where you can uh, perhaps eliminate or put off certain expenditures so that you can ensure ongoing liquidity. Make a financial contingency plan. Uh, this is something that may be tough and difficult, but for instance, you could consider delaying a payment of discretionary bonuses or other um, bonus payments going forward. Um, also, another step is you need to absolutely assess your current and future supply needs. You need to understand what you have now versus what you may need. And here, I would like to underscore that while we're going through these discussions about where we are with COVID-19 today, we also understand that many communities and many regions are already pivoting to discussions around reopening. Uh, the AMA has um, been compiling an action plan around reopening. It is not yet posted, but we hope to have that posted in the very short um, term because that is another big question we are getting. And this gets directly to future supply needs what you may need in the future. Other tips in our strategy document are understanding how to continue your business operations. You may need to consult with your uh, legal counsel if you feel like the guidance you're getting in your community and or your state from your governor is unclear on your emergency and shelter in place orders. Those really are where you need to start so that you can understand what you can and cannot do, where you can stay open and when you cannot. I will note, however, that despite even uh, many practices uh, being deemed providing essential services, such as pediatric practices who provide uh, vaccinations and well child visits, there's a tremendous challenge with those practices having um, uh, families and children not willing to come to the doctor due to concerns about safety with regard to um, uh, COVID transmission. So even though you may be thought of providing what is deemed as essential services, we've seen a tremendous cutback in visits for those who can offer those services. 
and this has had a huge impact on uh, practices financial bottom line. Another tip we advise is we need to you need to con consolidate your administrative resources, including all your coding tools. Um, it's it's important to put in place the main, the means to maintain your documentation during a full or partial shutdown, only because you need to keep and maintain your records, only to ensure that you are in a better position going forward when you do begin to reopen. I would also say this is a very important strategy that if you find that you have employees on your staff who are not deployed to the fullest extent, channeling some of those employees to doing this kind of work would be very helpful to maintaining the operations of the practice going forward when we do move to reopening. Managing workflow, refer to recommendations on the non-essential services when reviewing your practice's appointment schedule so that you can appropriately divert those patients and those appointments that are not um, allowed under an essential services. Utilize digital health tools. Again, we've talked a lot about the use of telehealth. It's important to communicate to employees and pa patients regarding the use and availability of your digital health tools. The AMA has a quick guide on telehealth that is again available and free on our website and you will find lots of tips and strategies for implementing digital health very quickly into practice. This uh, digital health guide has become our number one downloaded resource on our page, um, and also these financial strategies that we're going over today is a, is a third most downloaded tool. The, the second is really around understanding some of the public health issues. And finally, I'm gonna wrap up with my tips um, before I turn it over to my colleagues to talk about the federal program. Uh, communicating guidelines for employees. Um, it's important to put together some interim guidelines to assist employees with making the best healthcare decisions for themselves. In other words, and I think all of us who are now in a world of work from home, some employees may not have childcare. Um, some employees may have an elderly or sick parent at home. Some, as we know, healthcare providers are very concerned about ex uh, providing exposure um, to those family members at home. So you really need to put together and sit down with your team to understand their needs and uh, help to address them. I think this does a lot to ease the fears of employees who are coming to work each and every day on the front line, as well as to maintain a good cohesive team within your practice so that you can reemerge, hopefully strong. Plan ahead for employee furloughs. Um, this is a very difficult conversation. We know that many physician practices are having right now. We do have, in fact, just posted yesterday, a new resource on uh, entitled Making Tough Decisions. And this really is about practices when they're really feeling like they have to make some um, employment decisions, whether it be furloughs or terminations. Um, they really should review their contracts and consult with your legal, legal um, counsel. But there are some strategies that we suggest in this document that could perhaps head off making some of those tough decisions around termination or furloughs. For example, how to redeploy um, some of your employees, either within the practice or if uh, with proper checking around licensure and liability issues, allowing employees to go work at other places that may be hot spots in your state. So I think for those who are really facing these difficult challenges right now, I think that document does a deeper dive and can be very helpful to you all. Uh, also stay abreast of new care delivery flexibilities. Um, this is one where you can um, have potentially one administrative staff member just monitoring all the new changes that have that have been coming down. Many, many things have been waived um, by the federal government and or state and um, local communities with regards to some of the regulations, for example, Stark waivers, um, as well as other flexibilities um, that have been issued that you just probably won't be able to know about them unless you maybe have a dedicated staff person sort of monitoring those and communicating those, but you certainly can always follow the AMA COVID resource page where we are really up to date pretty much every day updating this fast and rapid moving situation coming from our uh, government and regulatory bodies. 
um, back to really sort of the clinical front line, uh, prepare for exposure incidents. Um, there really needs to be protocols in place for you to understand using the equipment that you have to limit potential exposure, not only for, for people who work in the practice, but clearly, obviously, for your patients. This point is going to be critical when you reopen, and our document, our action plan will cover ways for you to do that. And then my final tip um, that's in our resource page is really to ident identify and implement um, specific protocols with regards to COVID-19. Um, if you don't have particular guidance, you might need to understand within the best case for your practice is to develop those clinical protocols. One very simple example that I will give is really about um, uh, entering and exiting your um, practice. Um, and then also, how is the team who's in charge of what with regards to treating any patients who may come in with risk of exposure? So those are just very top line things. I urge you to go back and look at the guide, um, again, available. And at the end of this um, uh, presentation, I will have um, a list with all the links um, to the documents that are referenced throughout. Again, all of these are free and available to AMA members and non-members. Um, and finally, um, they, uh, they are um, up to date as possible, and the links will take you directly where you need to go because we know that time is very valuable. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleagues um, who are going to be addressing the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act, as well as loans and other financial assistance. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, George Cox. Thank you very much, Carol, and uh, thank you, Henry Schein, for this uh, opportunity, and uh, glad to be with everyone this afternoon. Uh, again, my name is George Cox. I'm the director of the Division of Legislative Council at the AMA's DC office, and as Carol mentioned, in this part of the presentation, Jennifer and I will provide a general overview of the key federal financial programs in the CARES Act that have been put into place to help physician practices and other small businesses impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Three of these key programs include the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, or EIDL loans, and the Debt Relief uh, for Small Businesses. Another program is the Main Street Lending Program, which will be run through the Federal Reserve. There are also certain tax credits physician practices may be eligible for. Also, Jennifer, Jennifer will discuss what economic relief is available for physician practices under the Department of Health and Human Services Provider Relief Fund, as well as the Medicare Advanced Payment Program, which has currently been put on pause, as she will explain. Our hope is that this overview will provide you with a basic knowledge of the financial relief that may be available to you in your practice. We have also included a number of hyperlinks to key websites where you can find more guidance and information. Since each of you uh, know your practice better than anyone and have been impacted by the COVID pandemic in different ways and are facing your own unique financial challenges, we strongly encourage you to consult with your lending institution, accountant, or attorney to determine the best course of action to meet the specific needs of your practice, whether it's through the programs we are discussing today or other options available to you through state, local, or commercial sources. Uh, next slide. The financial programs we're talking about today come from the CARES Act. This bill provided $2.1 trillion in funding for numerous provisions to help stem the public health threat from COVID-19 and to mitigate its economic impact. Some of the initial funding in the CARES Act was depleted within just a few weeks. So last week, Congress passed the latest COVID-19 relief bill, the Pro uh, Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act, which was signed into law last Friday. This bill provides $484 billion in additional funding to replenish programs under the CARES Act including the PPP and the EIDL loans. Next slide. The PPP is intended 
to incentivize small businesses to retain their employees on payroll by providing forgivable loans that help cover eight weeks of payroll costs, as well as mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. It is likely that some or many of you have already uh, are familiar with this program and may have already applied for and received PPP loans. Congress originally appropriated uh, this money, but it has already been so popular that it ran out of funding on April 16th, just two weeks after it was enacted. As of the 16th of April, the SBA had guaranteed over 1.6 million PPP loans, totaling $342 billion through almost 5,000 lenders. Fortunately, as I just mentioned, Congress provided additional funding and now an additional $310 billion is available for the PPP program, with $60 billion of that set aside for small, mid-size, and community lenders, including minority lenders. Also, there has been a strong backlash against some publicly traded companies that have received tens of millions of dollars in PPP loans, even though they have access to other sources of capital. This backlash uh, has prompted the Treasury Department late last week to release a revised guidance that will require many of these companies to return their PPP money by May 7th. This will likely add another couple hundred million dollars back into the program for use by truly small businesses. So with this new funding, the SBA began processing and paying out loans two days ago. There are already tens of thousands of applications in the queue waiting to be processed. So it is expected that this current funding will be depleted very soon. Since it is uncertain if and when Congress will provide additional funding in the future, you will need to act very quickly if you want to apply for a PPP loan. To qualify, your practice must have 500 or fewer employees. You will need to include in this count employees that are from affiliated businesses which I'm not gonna go into the details, but there is a detailed guidance document on the SBA and the Treasury's website that explains this. Sole proprietors and independent contractors and other self-employed individuals are also available. The loan amount can be up to 250% of your practice's average monthly payroll costs to cover eight weeks of payroll, rent, mortgage interest, and utilities. The maximum loan amount is $10 million. The types of costs you can include as payroll expenses include salaries and wages up to $100,000 per employee, employee benefits, including the cost of vacation, parental, family leave, or sick leave, and payments that require, uh, are required for the provision of group health care benefits, as well as uh, other expenses. The terms of the loans are very favorable. With a 1% interest rate, a six month deferment that can be extended to 12 months and a two year maturity. The key benefit of this forgiveness is the forgiveness feature of this loan, meaning that if you meet certain requirements, then the loan or part of the loan is forgiven, basically turning it into a grant. And anything left that is not forgiven gets turned into a two year loan under the terms I just mentioned. So how much will be forgiven? Well, basically, loan money you use to pay for payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, and utility payments over the next eight weeks after you receive the loan disbursement will be forgiven up to the amount of the loan. However, at least 75% of the forgiven amount must be used for payroll costs. Also, the amount of forgiveness may be reduced if you decrease the number of full-time employees or if you decrease salaries or wages by more than 25%. If you made any of these reductions between February 15th and April 26th, you will have until June 30th to restore your full-time employment and, and salary uh, levels. I'm now going to turn to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Actually, before that, I just, I, okay, go back one slide, sorry. So to apply for an existing SBA 
uh, uh, loan, you can uh, go, turn to a, an existing SBA lender or a participating federally insured depository institution. Uh, the links here will help you find a local lender to see uh, what applications uh, and other documents that you'll, uh, you'll need. Finally, you'll need to certify in good faith to several provisions, including that the current economic uncertainty makes the loan necessary to support your ongoing operations, that the funds will be used to retain workers and maintain payroll and certain other expenses. The Treasury Department and the SBA have published a guidance document to help borrowers determine the maximum PPP loan amount that they are qualified to receive. Okay, now I will turn to the economic injury disaster loans. So physician practices and other small businesses with 500 or fewer employees will be eligible for the SBA's idle loans to cover temporary loss of revenue due to the COVID-19 pandemic. These are lower interest loans that are available to pay for payroll and other operating expenses. While these loans are not forgivable like the PPP loan, they are more flexible than PPP in the types of expenses they cover, such as the cost of obtaining materials or repaying other obligations that cannot be met due to revenue losses. Idle loan amounts under the CARES Act can be up to $200 million, up $2 million, that's $2 million. The actual amount would be based on your practice's economic injury determined by the SBA, which will consider other sources of recovery funding, such as insurance proceeds. The SBA's affiliation rules also apply to idle loans. Also, an eligible practice that has applied for an idle loan can request a $10,000 advance on that loan, which the SBA must dis uh, disperse within three days. These advance payments do not have to be paid back, so they're basically a grant. However, if a small business receives an advance payment and also receives a PPP loan, and that PPP loan is forgiven, the amount of the advance payment will be subtracted from the amount forgiven in the PPP loan. Idle loans have very favorable terms. The interest rate on an idle is 3.75% with up to 30 years uh, to pay off the loan. Also, the SBA is granting small businesses who receive an idle loan due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think you need to go to the next slide, uh, an automatic one-year deferment period before they are required to start making payments. And if you happen to have an existing idle loan, the SBA has automatically deferred those payments through the end of 2020. Now, we have received lots of questions about whether a small business can apply for both a PPP and an idle loan. The answer is yes. However, if you take out both types of loans, you cannot use them to cover the same expenses. For example, you can't use both an idle loan and a PPP loan towards payroll expenses. So you might want to consider using a PPP for any payroll expenses and the idle loan for other working capital. This will ensure that you're using your PPP loan in a way that qualifies for forgiveness. And I cannot stress enough though, that you should consult with your lender before applying to both types of these loans. Also, as those of you who currently have a uh, business relationship with an SBA express lender, I want to point out that the SBA has an express bridge loan pilot program that will allow you to access up to $25,000 quickly. These loans can provide you with some financial support while waiting for a decision and disbursement on an EIDL loan. The bridge loan can be repaid in full or part of the proceeds uh, from the idle loan. Now, having said all this, as of this morning, the SBA uh, has not reinstated uh, uh, processing any new idle loans. So they have a uh, notice currently that says that any applicants who are already applied, uh, those will be processed on a first come first serve basis. But you should go uh, uh, to the website 
um, regularly to determine when these idle loans will be available again. I also want to point out that there is small business uh, debt relief under the SBA as well. So if you have an existing non-disaster SBA loan, you should be aware that the SBA is providing immediate relief by paying six months of principal interest and any associated fees that borrowers owe in a current 7A, 504, or microloan. Also, new borrowers of these non-disaster loans are also eligible for this relief um, than, uh, on any loan that is dispersed uh, before September 27, 2020. So now I want to turn to the Main Street Lending Program. This was created under Title IV of the CARES Act and authorizes the Federal Reserve, working with the Treasury Department, to make loans, loan guarantees, and other investments to, uh, and subsidies to provide liquidity for small and mid-sized businesses with up to 10,000 employees for losses incurred as a result of coronavirus. So just to make clear, this program has not been implemented yet. And according to reports this morning, it looks like it's gonna be another week or two before this program can start issuing loans. When it is implemented, it will be operationalized through two facilities at the Federal Reserve. One facility is called the Main Street New Loan Facility, which will service new loans, and the other is called the Main Street Expanded Loan Facility, which will facilitate increases in existing loans made to eligible businesses. The Federal Reserve has published the term sheets for these two facilities on its website at the links on this slide. This program is designed to encourage lenders to make low interest loans to eligible businesses with 10,000 or fewer employees. The minimum loan amount for these kind of loans is $1 million, the maximum loan amount will be up to $25 million. Other features of these loans include a four-year maturity, an interest rate that is no greater than 2%, and a one-year deferment on principal and interest. Also, these loans are intended for small to mid-sized businesses that have not otherwise received adequate economic relief in the form of loans or loan guarantees provided under other current loan programs. And these loans are not eligible for forgiveness. Finally, regarding the Main Street loans, there's a number of good faith certifications that borrowers must make uh, to, to receive a disbursement, including that the uncertainty of economic conditions makes it necessary for the loan to support ongoing operations uh, of the recipient. Uh, and there's some other requirements here. There's there's a, another dozen or so uh, bullet points that you can uh, read through on the Federal Reserve Main Street Lending Program website. Again, there's a link uh, on this side uh, to that. Finally, I want to talk about tax-related benefits. The CARES Act includes changes in the tax policies that could benefit physician practices. These changes include an employee retention tax credit. If the practice's business operations were fully or partially suspended due to a COVID-19 uh, shutdown order or gross receipts declined by more than 50% compared to the same quarter in the prior year. Eligible businesses could get a refundable 50% tax credit on wages up to $10,000 per employee. The tax credit uh, uh, can be obtained on wages paid or incurred from March 13, 2020 through December 31, 2020. Another provision allows taxpayers to defer paying the employer portion of the certain payroll taxes through the end of 2020 with all 2020 deferred amounts due in two equal installments, one at the end of 2021 and the other at the end of 2022. The employee retention credit and the tax deferral are not available to employers whose PPP loans have been forgiven. Physicians should consult with their tax consultants to determine if these benefits or others apply to their practice. 
And finally, this is not part of the financial programs, but just want to mention that the CARES Act did suspend the 2% Medicare sequester that applies to Medicare uh, payments uh, through the end of 2020. I'd now like to turn it over to my colleague, Jennifer. Great. Thank you, George. And thank you to everyone listening in today or on the recording at a later date. Uh, my name is Jennifer McLaughlin, and I am an Assistant Director of Federal Affairs at the AMA. And I want to turn to the second to last topic of this portion of the presentation, which is the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. This was established by Congress, first in the CARES Act, and then also added to in the COVID 3.5 bill that George mentioned at the outset of his presentation. Um, so this fund totals uh, at the outset $175 billion in financial relief for physicians, hospitals, dentists, and other healthcare providers who are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I do want to note that um, HHS has taken a number of steps to start distributing this money, but it is a very fluid situation. And if you are listening to this webinar um, as a recording after April 29th, I recommend visiting hhs.gov slash provider relief um, and the AMA resources at the end of this presentation for the latest information. But so what we know so far is that um, HHS moved really quickly um, in the beginning to disperse the first $30 billion in proportion to physicians and hospitals uh, and other providers shares of the 2019 um, Medicare fee-for-service payment. Um, the formula shared by HHS indicated the payment amount would equal about 3.2 weeks of each uh, TIN Medicare fee-for-service revenue. Again, these payments are grants, not loans, don't need to be repaid, um, and they must be used for healthcare-related expenses or lost revenues attributable to the novel coronavirus. Then last week, HHS announced additional funding priorities and allocation amounts for the remainder of the Provider Relief Fund, and I'll talk through two specific allocations in more detail. Uh, about the second tranche of the general allocation to Medicare physicians and hospitals, and also the uninsured um, coverage. I also want to flag for this audience that HHS has said it is prioritizing funding for skilled nursing facilities, dentists, and other providers who rely more on Medicaid than Medicare revenue, including pediatricians and obstetrician gynecologists. However, HHS has not yet specified when that funding will be made available. Next slide, please. So HHS has said uh, that the goal of the combined general allocation, um, which was the first 30 billion and also a second 20 billion, is to replace a percentage of a provider's annual gross receipts, sales, or program service revenue. How much a provider will receive from the second distribution will vary based on their net patient revenue um, and the provider's initial fee-for-service distribution in the first tranche. As you can see here, um, HHS did begin dispersing this money um, last week based on the information they have available in cost reports. However, physicians and other facilities who do not submit cost reports do have to go into that general distribution portal and upload specific information, um, including tax return information, as well as estimated revenue losses in March and also this month um, due to COVID-19. HHS also established a COVID-19 uninsured program um, with funding from the Provider Relief Fund um, to process and pay COVID-19 claims. Now, eligible healthcare providers that have conducted testing or provided treatment for uninsured COVID-19 patients on or after February 4th, 2020, will have to submit claims electronically um, and will be paid at Medicare rates subject to available funding. Um, and to start that process, providers and physicians and others need to go into that um, website portal that is linked here on this slide 
and enroll um, and also attest to a number of other eligibility criteria. And HHS has said that um, qualifying expenses that will be paid include testing for COVID-19, but also the related treatment services, including um, patient visits in the office, in the urgent care setting, in the emergency department, or via telehealth. Um, next slide, please. Now, I do want to flag um, that there are a number of terms and conditions associated with all of these provider relief funds and do encourage you to pay careful attention um, and review these closely. They are um, lengthy and a number of the terms and conditions um, have already been outlined in this presentation because they come from the statute directly, which are that payments are only for healthcare related expenses or lost revenues attributable to COVID-19 and also that payment um, cannot overlap with other funding sources. Um, we do know that the terms and conditions are quite uh, extensive um, and we have heard concerns and recognized the challenges of um, hiring uh, compliance attorneys and others, uh, especially for small practices um, and small businesses. And so we have encouraged uh, HHS to include a clear statement on the uh, attestation portal that it will not pursue penalties for physicians and others who make a good faith effort to comply with the terms and conditions. Then another condition, yes, that we've heard about um, and we've gotten a lot of questions about is the uh, restriction on balance billing. Um, we've gotten a number of questions about whether it applies to COVID-19 testing and treatment or um, whether physicians are prohibited from balance billing for care unrelated to COVID-19. Um, and so we've raised this question with HHS and did receive clarification from department officials that this restriction applies to COVID-19 care only. You can see here that uh, there are a number of other terms and conditions um, that are generally applicable to HHS grants um, and those grant recipients must attest to compliance with them. So I want to switch gears and talk about the Medicare Accelerated and Advanced Payment Program quickly. The punchline uh, George covered, which is that this program is currently paused, um, but I do want to give a little bit of background um, because so many uh, physicians and hospitals and others have accessed this program. I do want to cover just a few of the, of the basics so everyone has the same background. Um, CMS, uh, at the outset of this pandemic did greatly expand this program to provide some cash flow assistance to physician practices that have been facing financial turmoil. The program provides an advance on future Medicare payments in the amount of up to three months historical Medicare payments. Um, requests had to go to the Medicare administrative contractors and who had been distributing the payments within a few days. Now, there are a few drawbacks to this program. Um, and the AMA and 140 other state medical and national specialty societies sent a letter to Congress urging them to make improvements to the program, including lowering the interest rate to zero and also extending the repayment period. The next slide shows a hypothetical repayment window where you can see if a Medicare loan was issued in early April the automatic claims recruitment begins in early August and the repayment grace period would end in early November. And then on the next slide, you can see here's where we are today, which is that on April 26, CMS announced that it was pausing the program, no longer accepting new applications from Medicare Part B suppliers, which includes physicians and other health professionals. CMS noted it had already distributed approximately $100 billion in loans the hospitals, physicians, and others, and was reevaluating how the program overlaps with other funding sources, such as the provider relief fund that we went over. And I want to let you know that just yesterday, the AMA sent a letter to CMS strongly urging the agency to quickly reinstate this program with improved terms, including a longer repayment period, a lower interest rate, and importantly, to expand this program to provide cash flow assistance to Medicaid providers. Finally, 
I want to wrap up by letting you know uh, there continue to be ongoing discussions about additional legislation in this space, and the AMA continues to advocate for additional financial assistance. Here I have listed out a number of recommendations that we've made for Congress, including increasing the Medicare conversion factor, uh, providing Medicare and Medicaid pay parity, and waiving budget neutrality for the 2021 evaluation and management code changes. Um, we also included, and I've already talked about, improvements to the Medicare Advanced Payment Program. So that is the end of our high-level overview of the programs, and I want to turn it back now to Carol to talk about resources available. Thank you so much, Jennifer and George. Um, I will quickly turn to questions, but I just wanted to flag for everyone again on this page um, in the slides that you will receive our direct links to the multitude of resources that we have developed and continue to roll out. We've covered a tremendous amount of material today. So we encourage you to come and look at the deeper dives on all of these um, again. So let me turn it over now to uh, Sanchia, who will be managing our question and answer session. Absolutely, and thank you so much for all of that information. I'm going to go right to the questions as we have a few minutes, and there are actually a lot of questions that have come in from providers. The first question is, does PPP cover malpractice and other liability costs after the 75% threshold is met? So this is uh, George. Uh, no, that's part, not one of the expenses that it's intended uh, uh, to cover. It's uh, covering uh, um, payroll expenses, uh, mortgage interest, rent, uh, and utilities. Okay. Thank you, George. Second question, and I'll do it in first person because that's how it came in. I applied for the first PPP loan and did not get it. Do I have to apply again for the newly approved SBA PPP, or will the previous application be used? Hi, this is George again. Um, so it's going to depend on your lender. So you need to reach out to your lender ASAP. Most lenders are reprocessing uh, or have just held in queue uh, in order that uh, they process uh, the applications. So if you have not heard from your lender uh, since uh, April 16th, contact them right away and ask what the status of the program is. Again, most lenders are just have queued everything up and are processing them in order, but some lenders, from what I've heard, uh, uh, are requiring uh, folks to reapply. Also, make sure that uh, when you've submitted your application that you have confirmation from your lender that they have all the documents that they need for the loan to be processed. Okay, uh, this is a very popular question. What What is the time frame for loan approval? We submitted ours two weeks ago, but have not heard anything. I believe it was 10 days. So, um, and most uh, lenders have been, uh, uh, from what I've heard, is, have been very quick in responding. Because it's it, there, there's a lot of unique things about this loan that can accelerate the pro, uh, the um, approval process, like you don't need to put up uh, collateral. Um, so again, if uh, contact your lender, if you're finding that your lender is not responsive, I strongly encourage you to go onto the SBA website, and they have a, and, and it's one of the links on, on the slide deck, uh, they have a lender finder. You put your zip code in, and you will find uh, the SBA approved or other uh, participating lenders in your area. And um, you know, we've heard from a, a lot of physicians uh, who have gone through this process, and there's various levels of experiences from I never heard from my lender to I got approved right away, got the money, no problem. So again, um, be proactive, and if you have not heard from your lender, uh, contact them right away. Okay. Um, if an employee prefers to stay at home because they're scared or if they leave because of personal reasons or move to another job, 
does that count against us according to the PPP? That's a good question. Um, I think it's more it is, on yeah. the, yeah, it's more on the the uh, employer and the the uh, the. It's, I don't think they're going to be looking at the reason uh, when they're considering uh, the loan. It's really the uh, you know the practice as an employer of your whether or not you've ha maintained uh, uh, your staff. And uh, so um, that's a good question. I, th I think so. That might be something we have to look a bit a little bit more into and. Uh, we'll let the Henry Shine people know if we have more guidance on that. Yes, and okay. I would add that this is another, I think this lends itself to another reason to have a plan um, in place for how you um, communicate with your employees, as well as document, um, because I think if there is a gray area, it's always important to be um, documenting what's been transpiring, if there are any questions um, in the uh, cleanup phase of this as we move forward. Okay, wonderful. There, there are a series of other questions that I think may or may not be answered by the key resources that are here on this slide. This webinar will be provided to you, the recording of it, al along with this presentation at the um, permission of the American Medical Association. At this time, to honor your time and our presenters, I just want to thank uh, you, Carol, and George, and Jennifer, so much on behalf of the uh, Henry Shine team. We, we appreciate you and your resources. Thanks to every provider. We had hundreds and hundreds join across the country today. Thank you for your time. And please follow up with us um, if you have other questions and or need additional information. We will continue with the COVID webinar series, and we'll keep you connected and informed. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you again.